Some of you don't have a clue who I am, and uh, you're blessed. But some of you that know me, uh, I know you're shaking your head. But, uh, you know, one of the things that has changed here is they don't let Greg McKenzie have a Diet Coke in his hand while he's passing out bulletins. So, um, anyway... Well, it is so glad, I'm so glad, Pam and I, to be here, uh, 2002 of June. Uh, we moved all the way from Oklahoma and came to Crossroads and spent, as Nancy said, about nine years here. And uh, then God had other plans and became a missionary for, well, still a missionary. And um, last April, we moved to Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, where that is home now, and uh, we're thoroughly enjoying being a part of that. So today, I want to do, I want to share with you something that's been on my heart for quite a while now. I actually even preached it in the church we're at, but I want to talk to men today. Um, I think it's important, especially in the church, especially our society, that comes against and degrades and uh, downplays what manhood is all about. And I believe the church is at a crossroads, uh, not the church crossroads, but a literal crossroads um, dealing with men and their role in their family and in the church. And so uh, we want to talk about that today. So if you would just pray with me. And we'll get into the message. Father, thank you for this day. God, thank you for Crossroads and Lowell's vision. And years ago, stepping out and planting this church and the lives that have been touched and changed because of your word. I ask today, Holy Spirit, that you would speak through me, that your word would go out. And we know as it goes out, it does not return back to you void but accomplishes all your purposes. So we ask, Father, that you would speak not just to the hearts of the men today, but to all of us. Holy Spirit, have your way, and God, stir in us, hungering and thirsting for righteousness in this day that we live. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. I want to read you a story, true story of a man named Polycarp. He was the bishop of the church of Smyrna. He um, was discipled by the apostle John. And I just want to read this account. It says, Polycarp was grabbed into a Roman Colosseum. Discipled by the apostle John himself, the aged bishop faithfully and selflessly led the church at Smyrna through the persecution prophesied by a spiritual father. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer, writes John in Revelation 2.10. Be faithful even to the point of death. John had died about a half century before that. He spoke those words to Polycarp. Then, he, uh, then John had died, but the words he spoke still rang in Polycarp's ear as a Colosseum crowd chanted, let the lions loose. That's when he heard a voice from heaven that was audible above the crowd say to him, be strong, Polycarp, play the man. That's when uh, days before the Roman bounty hunters had tracked him down and and instead of fleeing, Polycarp fed them a meal. Perhaps that's why they granted his last request an hour of prayer. Two hours later, many of these who heard the way Polycarp prayed actually repented of their sin on the spot. They did not, however, relent on the mission. Like Jesus entering Jerusalem, Polycarp was led into a city of Smyrna on a donkey. The Roman proconsul implored Polycarp to recant. Swear by the genius of Caesar. Polycarp held his tongue and held his ground. The proconsul prodded, Swear and I will release thee, revile the Christ. Eighty and six years I have served him, said Polycarp, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? 
Polycarp was led to the center of the Colosseum, where three times the proconsul announced, Polycarp has confessed himself to be a Christian. The crowd chanted for death by beast, but the proconsul opted for fire. As his executioner seized his wrist to nail him to the stake, Polycarp stopped them. He who gives me strength to endure the fire will enable me to do so without the help of the nails. As the wood was lit on fire, Polycarp prayed one last prayer. I bless you because you have, t you have thought me worthy of this day and this hour to be numbered among your martyrs in the cup of your Christ. Soon the flames engulfed him, but strangely they did not consume him. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before him, Polycarp was fireproof. Instead of the stench of burning flesh, the scent of frankincense wafted through the Colosseum. Using a spear, the executioner stabbed Polycarp through the flames. Polycarp bled out, but not before the 12th martyr of Smyrna had lived out John's exhortation. Be faithful even to the point of death. Polycarp played the man. What does it mean to play the man? And today we want to kind of look at that. What does it mean as a man of God, a man that's sold out? What, is it, what does that mean to play the man? In 2 Samuel 10, 12, it says, Be of good courage, and let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our God, which seems good to our God. Galatians 5, 1 says, It is for freedom that we have been set free. Stand firm then, and let, let not yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. And then in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14, it says, Be faithful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. For the last several months, three or four months, God has laid on my heart the issue concerning men and being men of God, men that stand firm in the faith, men that are men of character, of integrity and authenticity. And as um, when Lowell had asked me to preach, I began to pray, and there were several things that I thought about. There were several things that I'd like to share, but that just kept coming back to this. In Newsweek magazine, there was an article many years ago written, and the title was, Men is Destiny. The essence of this article was that as men go, so goes the nations. Now, we know Newsweek is not a Christian magazine, so I want to add what God's Word says about. As men go, so goes the family, and so goes the church, and so goes the nation. As we step up to the plate as men of God, as we accept our role and who, how God has created us and what he's called us to do, then we begin to make the impact in our cities and in our nation and around the world. It is when, men, we play the man. We are who God calls us to be, not just here on Sunday morning, but it is in our families, in our living rooms, in the bedrooms. It is in the marketplace. It is wherever we go that we live the way God has called us to live. I believe that we are at a crucial junction in the church today. And it is with the issue of men being men of God. Now there's two narratives today that we see quite a bit. The first narrative is what I call the macho man. How many of you remember the village people? Okay, that tells your age right here. But they had a song, not YMCA, but they had a song called Macho Man. And it goes, macho, macho, macho. 
Ah, uh, you know the Kenyans would never do it like that. So I'm going to be a macho man. And you know the village people, you got an Indian, you got a construction worker in black leather pants, black shirt with no shirt on, hairy chest, and a hard hat on. And that's what's supposed to picture what manhood is. But see, manhood, the narrative of manhood that we've grown up, that I grew up with, is that you look at women, you objectify them, you use them for your own pleasure and purposes, that this whole male macho chauvinism is seen all over. Even today in 2019, even in Concord, North Carolina, and so that narrative is played out. How many of you guys, your dad said, big guys or big boys don't cry? Anybody hear that? Men don't cry. Men don't show emotion. Men are doers. The problem that is with that, God has created us as human beings, not human doing. And because we are human beings, that means there's a relationship and there's intimacy and there's more than just sucking it up, not crying, and being a man. The second narrative is this, is that there's no distinction today. There's no difference between the man and the woman. It flattens out gender. This is very popular today, even in Africa that it just flattens everything out between the genders. Nothing is distinct about a man or a woman. But in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, we're going to look at, Paul is making a distinction for you and I. We're taught that di distinction means inequality. That's not true. Differences does not mean not equal. It just means we're different. My wife and I are different. We're different physically. We're different in even how we process things, where she comes from. It doesn't mean my way is better or her way is better or mine is worse. It just means that it's different. But today we're trying to flatten it out and saying there is no difference between male and female. The word of God begs to differ. There is a difference. But it doesn't mean that it's bad. So in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, if you're taking notes, there are several things that Paul talks about that I want to tie to what it means to be a man of God. What it means, this masculinity thing that's being bombarded, railed against. You know, if you watch on TV today, and we get TV in Africa so we can see some of this, is that the man's an idiot. He's a bumbling fool. He can't ever do anything right. And that's the whole agenda of the world, to minimize what God has called you and I, men, to be and do. And to stand in our place that God has called us to stand, not with arrogance, not with chauvinism, but in humility and a contrite heart to stand in that place. Notice the first thing. He says, be, be watchful. Some translations say pay attention. Be sober. Men, we are to be aware what's going on. We're to be aware of what's going on in our family. Men, you're to be aware of what's going on with your wife. You're to be aware of what's going on with your children. You're not just to bring the paycheck home, then plop in the couch, get the remote, and watch ESPN. You're to be engaged, watchful, sober, diligent concerning your family. Same way in the marketplace. It's not just about getting a check. It's about being a watchman on the wall. Ezekiel 22, 30 says this. I look for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land. So I would not have to destroy it, but I found no one. 2003, 
Teresa Phillips came to my office. She had a drawing, and it was usually in 3D and had all these pictures, but it was a picture of the wall, and on it, there was nobody on the wall, and she said, the Lord says there needs to be watchmen on the wall. I believe we're at, we've been at that time, but I believe we're at the time, the watchmen on the wall are the men. And the men have relegated that watchman position to the women and been off doing all the other things. But I believe God is calling us now, today, to be men that are on the wall that are looking out, seeing when the enemy is approaching, knowing the seasons and times we live in, and being watchful in everything. Number two, he says, stand firm in the faith. I want you to notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say stand firm in your degrees. He doesn't say stand firm in your intellect. He doesn't say stand firm in your disciplines. He says stand firm in the faith. This is critical for us as men. Now, when I'm saying men, I'm talking to the men, but ladies, pay attention because this applies to you too. He says, stand firm in the faith. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, stand firm in the Lord and in his mighty power, putting on the whole armament of God, the armor. You see, we're not leaning on our own strength, Proverbs 3 says, but we're leaning on his strength. It means to make yourself at home, to sit upon, one whole weight upon. So when we are being strong in his faith, in the faith, we're trusting in him, not our own understanding. It's like Chronicles. It says, the men of Issachar understood the times and seasons they lived. But it also goes on to say, they knew how to implement the strategy. Men today, when we stand firm in the faith, God gives us the prophetic strategies of our time to stand firm in the marketplace. Even if we have a down economy, God's economy is never down. Even if marriages are falling by the wayside, God has a plan for those marriages. And so he says, stand firm in the faith. What we do, man, is we stand in the finished work of Jesus Christ. We stand firm in what Jesus has done for us. Not what I've done, because I haven't done squat. But what God has done through Jesus Christ, I now stand firm in that. I rest in his goodness. I rest in his grace. I rest in his provision. I rest in his mercy in everything. So why do we stand firm in the faith? And I was thinking about this. It's because as men, we have a tendency to deal with shame. I... If we could just pull back the curtain, every man has said, man, I've blown it. I'm not good enough. I don't have what it takes. And we've been told that. And so there's this element of men. If we had time just to talk to men in general, it would prove out true. When that happens, we deal with shame. And usually, as men, we deal with shame one of two ways. We withdraw. Pam calls that Craig going in his cave. She says, oh, are you going in your cave? When she says it makes me even madder when she says that. So we withdraw. We become passive. Men, nod your head if you know what I'm talking about. We become passive. We do the passive-aggressive thing. We retreat. We withdraw because of the shame. But then the other side of that is we become aggressive. It's where you have a lot of spousal abuse, physical, emotional, spiritual, religious abuse because men deal with this shame. They don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to bring it out. They try to hide and pose and try to be something that they're not instead of walking in their God-given identity. So then they become aggressive. Some of you ladies today, your husbands are aggressive. 
They use words to, to cut you. Proverbs says that life and death is in the power of the tongue. And so when we don't know what to do with our shame, when we don't know our identity, you'll either withdraw or you'll become aggressive. You see, if people really knew how many times that we just feel we're not good enough, we don't measure up, we're never going to win, it would blow your mind today. I've been doing this for 41 years, and the many men that I've counseled, inevitably there's a part that shame plays in their life. So, what do we do? We stand firm in the faith. In other words, we lean in to God's grace. We lean in to his goodness. And we believe what he says about us, man. The problem is today, man, you've believed the lie of the world. You've believed what the world has said about you instead of believing what God says about you. And so when we stand firm in the faith, even in the midst of opposition, even in midst of the lies, we stand firm in who God says we are and our identity in him and not backing up. Standing firm in the faith means we have the strength in the midst of our weaknesses for God's grace to be made manifest. Let me say this, man. Our weaknesses are the greatest opportunity to display the gospel in your family and in the world. Let me say that again. Your weaknesses, my weaknesses, are the greatest opportunity to display the gospel. Because I know I'm weak. I know I screw up. I know I mess up. But in the midst of my weaknesses, God says my grace is sufficient for you. And this is for you too, ladies. But his grace is sufficient for us in the midst of our weaknesses, in the midst of our shame, in the midst of us blowing it as husbands or as dads and blowing as employer or employee. In the midst of it all, we're standing firm and God's grace comes in and that shame is eradicated and we walk in our identity as men of God holding our head high, not in arrogance, but with a contrite, broken heart that allows us to face this world and says there's a better way, man. There's a better opportunity. The world has painted a bad picture, but I want to paint a picture of what it means to play the man, to be the man in every way. The next thing, he says, be strong. Proverbs says this, though a righteous man falls seven times, what does he do? Anybody know? He gets back up. You see, the issue isn't falling. God knows we're going to fall. God knows we're going to trip. The issue is laying there and playing the victim card. Men, I want to talk to you as a man. Stop playing the victim. Get up. Be a man. God will dust you off. Quit blaming your mom. Quit blaming your dad. Quit blaming your wife. Quit blaming your job. And stand up and play the man. We need to be strong men that know who we are in Christ and that our strength comes from him, not our own self-strength. Self-strength never accomplished anything. But God's strength and resting in his strength transforms cities and nations. It's leaning into him and trusting him. And then when I fall down, guess what? 
Instead of allowing shame to put the chains and the shackle me down on the ground, I break loose because I know who I am. I know what God has done for me, and I play the man. And that I walk in his strength, not in my strength. Adam and Eve were in the garden. Perfect union with God. Perfect intimacy. And every day he'd come in the cool of a garden and they would hang out and then sin entered in. Adam goes, ah, you're naked. Well, you're naked too. Uh-oh, we need to do something. Shame came on them, and so they clothed themselves. They got fig leaves, or some type of leaf, and they covered themselves. You see, it was God's, never his intention that we try to cover ourselves and try to do it in our own strength. God says, that's not going to work. He kills an animal, makes animal skins, and God clothes them. You see, when we play the man, we're not afraid of being found out. We don't let shame keep us in the darkness, but we bring everything to the light because shame has no hold on us. And our strength is in him realizing that I can't do this unless God comes in. You know, I, I can't love Pam the way Jesus loves the church apart from God and the Holy Spirit. By the way, we celebrated our 40th anniversary uh, in May. Yeah. We are accepting gifts, money, whatever. Um, no. But here's the reality. I've tried to do it in self-strength, and it was a mess. I tried to love our boys in self-strength, and it, did, it wasn't good. But when I stood firm in the faith, knowing my identity, and was strong in him, I'm able to love her. Now, I want to confess, I mean, you know, at church we always come and play act and put on these nice faces, praise God, hallelujah, how are you? Oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, and your whole life has fallen apart. We play act, even here. But I just want you guys to know, listen, I screw up. I'm not perfect. There's times I'm very selfish and would much rather love myself than to love my wife. To connect, to be intentional, to connect with her. With my boys, which they're men now, I mess up. And I allowed shame for years to chain me, to hold me back which is nothing more than a lie of the enemy. And I know every man here struggles. And the, part of the, the point of this message isn't to put shame and condemnation. The point is to encourage you to play the man, to be the man, to be the man that God's called you to be. Listen, you don't have to do it like me because you're different. Do it the way God's created you to do it. Be who God's called you to be and walk in that with authenticity and integrity in every way. Listen, when you fall down, get back up. Get back up. Ladies, you have a critical part in the role of your husband. The biggest cheerleader I have is my wife. I know this as a fact. Every day my wife praise for me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Every part of my body, my hands, my eyes, my mouth, every day. I know that. I don't know much, but I do know this, that every day she prays for me. And ladies, instead of nagging your husband, why don't you start praying for them? Why don't you just get on your knees every day and stop seeing 
the speck in their eye when you got a log and start asking God to reveal your husband the way he sees him to you, to prophetically see that and then begin to pray into that. You have a huge part in helping them play the man. Then the last thing, and the worship team can come on up. It says, you know, I hate it when your iPad messes up. That is just a bummer. Um, it says, all right, here we go. It says, let all that you do be done in love. Everything, 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 everything that we do is to be done in love. If you don't remember anything else about the message, remember this. The motivating force of male masculinity is love. It's not how big your biceps are. It's not how big your check is. It's not about the title. It's not about prestige and popularity. The overriding thing is love. The motivating force to play the man is love. The motivating force for me to love my wife is Christ, love the church is love because Jesus first loved me. You see, we're so twisted on this. You know, David was a shepherd boy, a psalmist, and he wrote poetry. Not what I would call the man's man. But this shepherd boy learned to hear God's voice on the backside of the hill. He learned intimacy with the Father. He wrote most of the Psalms, but yet he had a macho man moment and he blew it. But that didn't define him, that's not who he was. He went on and God said, this is a man after my own heart. Men, there are things that you've done that are the macho man moments, but that's not who you are. You're a son called by God to walk in this earth, to love extravagantly, to believe deeply in the grace of God and to be who God's called you to be. Stand with me. Father, we just thank you for your word today. Holy Spirit, right now, just begin to do only what you can do. You're the one that draws and speaks to our hearts. I pray for marriages right now that are struggling in this crowd. Lord, by the power of your spirit, touch them right now. Break those chains of offenses, of bitterness. Break them. Lord, for the man here today that's in the adulterous affair, Holy Spirit, move. Convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And Holy Spirit, I ask, crossroads today, there would be a movement of men that no longer sit back passive, but would step to the front and say, here am I. I'm ready, Lord. Use me. Whatever it looks like, whatever it takes, I'll play the man. I'll be the man that my wife needs that my children need. I'll be the man that this church needs. I'll be the man in this city that this city needs so that your fame might be spread throughout Concord, North Carolina, and the world. Thank you, Father, for your work today. I pray this in Jesus' name.